who's going to talk to us about diagnostics after this wonderful talk that we just had, which kind of illustrates the, the principle of sometimes the fungus isn't so much infecting us, it is pre-decomposing us. So uh, GR is going to walk up right now. Okay, well, great. Well, thanks so much for the organizers for inviting me uh, to be here and talk about diagnostics of the endemic mycoses today. So our, our key questions really, and this has been alluded to already, but really the expanding geographic range of these different endemic mycoses. So 10% of these are diagnosed outside their traditional region of endemicity. So really no matter where you practice in the country, even in the world, you still will see these different infections. Uh, one thing that's become pretty clear is the taxonomic uh, updates for these organisms as well as the molds that was alluded to in the, in the mold meeting this afternoon. And then really the focus of this will be on new diagnostic methods, uh, rapid diagnostics, sort of the kinetics of serology that we use, and then some of the unique toxicities. So a lot of these patients with endemic mycoses end up on lifelong therapy, so toxicity is a big problem for these different infections. Um, so here's just sort of a list of what uh, we're going to discuss. So I'll skip histo, blasto, and emergent mycoses amansia. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, just out of respect for the other discussants who, who will go through those in detail today. So we'll focus really on those middle four, coxy, paracoxy, Tyleromycosis and sporotrichosis. So I put these cases in, not because they're particularly challenging, but just because they kind of break up um, these different endemics from one another, a little bit easier to, to mentally think through. So the first case is a 45-year-old with recurrent pneumonia who came into us for a second opinion. Uh, it's a 45-year-old African-American male, really with no prior mes past medical history at all. He came in with severe cough and chest pain. He's a long-haul truck driver uh, with a recent project in Bakersfield, California, which is really ground zero for this in, in California. Had no headache or musculoskeletal complaints, and he just appeared tired, had coarse breath sounds and no skin lesions. So, of course, this is no diagnostic dilemma in the endemic mycosis section. Uh, and you can see these arthrocnidia here to the right and then a large uh, spherule structure there. Um, but one of the, so, so I'll really kind of highlight not only diagnostic, but just sort of what's new in the endemics. And so this is a paper that Dave Engelthaler and the group out of TGen has, has put forth just over the last few years to look at the geographic expansion and not only where Coxie is now, but how did it get there, and sort of what's the evolutionary biology, certainly that John talked about as well. So we've sequenced a huge number of these coxie isolates. There's been over 300 sequenced now, uh, and this really sort of put out the out of Arizona hypothesis. So you can sort of use uh, molecular clocks from these organisms, that is the, mo the more diverse they are, the older they are. Um, so you can see Posidaceae had really a lot of granular structure. There's even different clades, sort of there's a Tucson and Phoenix separate clade and then a Tex-Mex uh, clade. This is, there's been species that it, we've, we've talked about renaming these all to the species level to sort of add to the taxonomic confusion of all the uh, endemics. Uh, and then Coxidius imitus, you can see here, is clearly a separate species. And it looks like their most recent common ancestor was about five million years ago. Um, so John talked extensively about sort of the theory for these uh, requirement for mammalian reservoirs, so I won't go through that um, either today. But really what we're struggling with in California is this the continual increase in the epidemiology of this infection. So we think about 150,000 people are affected yearly. That's probably a gross underestimate. The CDC is actively updating these numbers now. We think it may be up to three times that. Fortunately, about a third of our patients really are subclinical. They never come to clinical attention. They're effectively immune. They've acquired infection. They're identified by skin tests and epidemiologic surveys, but never recall having an illness. But the main problem for us in the endemic region is a fourth of all community-acquired pneumonia is actually caused by coccidioides. And if you look at the IDSA and ATS guidelines, there's really no recommendation at all put forth about how to test these patients. They don't, they don't recommend when these patients should be tested for an endemic mycosis. Um, so this is typically what happens is they come in for a second or thir third round of antibiotics uh, for treated presumed bacterial infection when they actually have coccidioides. So I, I've really sort of struck out so far talking to both of those groups about making some type of recommendation for testing of the endemic mycoses in these hyperendemic regions for patients that come in with community-acquired pneumonia. So if one in four patients in the emergency room actually has coxie and not a bacterial pneumonia in this era of stewardship, this would really be of great uh, help to all of us. And there are rapid diagnostics that can be used for screening these patients in a very quick fashion. So one of the other things is it's definitely coxie season. You can see here from, Davis, um, from data we have at UC Davis um, from 2016, which is the green line, 2017 is the blue line, and then 2018, we've been a little unclear what's going to happen. You know, we had a lot of cases in January and February, which we thought were sort of just the continued down, uh, decrease from the year before, but they definitely have increased now that we're in sort of our peak coxie season in California. So we presume that 2018 will be just as bad as 16 and 17, 
which have been the worst years ever on record for coccidioides. So if you have patients from coming back from the endemic region, they've been on vacation or at a golf trip or a uh, conference, um, uh, so please think about this infection in those patients. So diagnostics, um, I think most people here, of course, know don't open a white mold in the lab. Um, so here's a picture of the arthrokinidia. The ID50 in mice can be one arthrokinidia, um, so, so very infectious uh, for, for our patients. Has very characteristic histopathology. And then serologic diagnosis really remains the standard, so immunodiffusion complement fixation. It can be negative in the immunocompromised or very early in infection, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. It's also prognostic. So titers more than uh, 1 to 16 are highly correlated with disseminated infection. So a titer of 1 to 32 gives an individual patient about a 50% chance of having um, underlying disseminated disease. Uh, a positive test in the spinal fluid is a confirmatory test on the new MSGERTC guidelines. And then we have found that treating these patients really early with fluconazole will actually abrogate their IgG response. So they'll never develop an IgG antibody if we treat them within 14 days of symptom onset. So EIA, there's a couple different manufacturers. The Meridian assay really has the most problems um, as far as false positivity. The others are quite a bit better. And then there's a lateral flow assay uh, that's really, we, we were hoping, is going to be a big help, again, to screen some of these patients up, up front. It's sort of a very quick uh, answer, just similar to the crypto lateral flow. So we're, we're hopeful that'll really make a big impact in early diagnostics for this disease. So others that are new, sort of alternative methods, the, the uh, antigen testing, so that really varies widely by the host. So highly immunosuppressed patients such as AIDS or transplant, they often do have a positive antigen. Antigen's been looked at in the spinal fluid as well. We've had sort of a mixed results with that, trying to look at it over time as a response to therapy. Others, uh, the UCLA group has a lot of patients that they've looked at, and they've had a little better success uh, using that um, prognostically over time. PCR really has a limited sensitivity. For most of the patients, it's helpful very early in the disease. Um, or, or on uh, histopathology, but really no difference in sensitivity between culture for those patients. And then there is a new skin test, um, and so the, the new skin test is called Spherisol uh, compared to the prior one, Spherulin. The new skin test has only about a 60% sensitivity compared to the prior version, so it's pretty limited in its utility. It's been looked at by the prison system. They, they skin tested all the inmates on intake to prison to sort of allocate them uh, to which prison they were going to be housed in. Um, so some of the prisoners actually were skin test negative but refused to go uh, to other prisons, and so they're now in the endemic zone and, and struggling with uh, coccidioides from that as well. So still a lot of work to do diagnostically to try to screen out these patients at highest risk of acquisition of infection. Um, <clears throat> so diagnostics. Uh, so this is a paper that's just ahead of print. It's, I think it just came out this week. So we looked at a cohort of 600 of our patients that all were treated with azoles, uh, and have at least five years of follow-up to sort of draw these standard curves, which hadn't been up updated in quite some time. So real early in infection, again, and just like you would see with any other infectious disease, antigen, PCR, and culture are positive, then formation of IgM, IgG, uh, and the kinetics of this are highly variable. Some of our patients do disseminate. That's, that's probably less than 3%, more like 1% of the patients. And then with treatment, they will eventually recover. Um, but what we noticed when we looked at this big cohort of patients is several of these, about 5% of the patients will have these spikes of their IgG antibody years later. Um, and so it's presumed for a while by others in the field that these were false positive results. But if you look at the kinetics of these serologies, they're not false positives. They'll spike back up to a one to eight titer, and then three months later they're one to four, and then they're one to two. So they have a very similar kinetic profile to those with acute infection. So what we actually think, these patients are reinfected. So if you live in the endemic region, you have about an 8% chance per year of being infected, which would fit very well with these patients. They're still living and residing in the endemic area. So we think this is just an amnesic response. They typically have very mild symptoms. They recover quite well. So reinfection is certainly one of the um, criteria we put forward. It could also be a ruptured granuloma, such as happens in tuberculosis with a gone complex. These may just uh, rupture uh, within the body and then through their amnesic response fight those off as well. And again, we don't think that these are false positives just based on the kinetics of these serologic profiles. So looking at the same cohort of patients, we, we fractionated them uh, between different forms of disease. So you can see this bottom line as the uncomplicated pulmonary disease. So these are patients that had just acute pneumonia and recovered quite well. You can see the kinetics of, of their titers go down relatively rapidly compared to those in red, which are the chronic pulmonary disease. They take quite a bit uh, longer to get better. And then those with uh, meningitis and disseminated disease that's non-meningitis, you can see these, these are actually parallel curves, uh, but they take a substantially longer amount of time to get better. So we thought this was helpful. We have a lot of clinicians call us and ask, how quickly should my patient be getting better? So now we're building sort of a computer algorithm where they can log in online, put their patient serologies in, and it will graph their kinetics compared to these sort of standard curves. So we think that'll be really helpful 
for our patients. So one of the other things that's come up over the last few years is these patients that we think are serofast, and that's been sort of against the dogma in the field to call these patients serofast, but it seems to happen almost exclusively in those that started with really high titers, but you can see here, even those with uncomplicated disease, a significant number of patients do maintain a detectable titer. Most of these are at a titer of one to one. Um, and the patients are off medications for five or six years. We have very good follow-up on them. But if they're going to go for a solid organ transplant, that really complicates their management. So a lot of the transplant centers don't want to transplant them if they have any detectable titers. So we think this is pretty helpful to get them to sort of um, push forward with momentum uh, to get a transplant. We do think that, that about 5 to 10 percent of these patients can be serofast, as seen in lots of other infectious diseases, of course. So that's sort of where we're going in the future, but one of the things that I did want to talk about is stuff you can do now in your hospital if you practice in an area with the endemic mycoses, because you can see a lot of these different endemics uh, after resolution of the pneumonia, they do cause sort of a, a pulmonary nodule as a residual. So coccidioides does this, blastomyces, histoplasma, and cryptococcus. You can see all can sort of heal as a, a scar or a pulmonary nodule. And with the recent changes in the USPSTF recommendations for low-dose CAT scanning, for current and former smokers, we're seeing a lot more of these nodules incidentally detected, and they can be very difficult to tell apart from stage one lung cancer. So PET scan is not always reliable. They can be hypo or hyperactive uh, on a PET scan. The endemic mycosis can. They can be positive or negative on a PET scan. And bronchoscopy, just given the peripheral location of these, is not always that helpful either. So a sensitivity of 65 to 88 percent. And so those patients, of course, then get a transthoracic biopsy. And again, they're non-diagnostic as well. So one of the things that we've started to do is this electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. So the way this works is just a standard um, bronchoscopy equipment, but sort of the software package is different. And that's, of course, proprietary, and you have to buy it from the companies. There's three different companies that make this. But you put these leads on their chest that sort of work. They look just like EKG leads, but they're triangulating the position of the bronchoscope. Um, so despite, maybe your pulmonologists are different, but ours will never admit when they're wrong, ever. Um, <laughs> So this tells them when they're wrong. So you can see here on sort of a transverse versus a coronal section, it sort of puts, it uses the CT scan from the patient as well as this sort of GPS triangulation procedure where exactly they are with the bronchoscope. Um, so, so as you can see here, it also shows a blood vessel right next to their bronchoscope so that they won't biopsy that and cause complications. And their goal here is to get sort of the green ball in the middle of the orange circle, and that's how they know they're in the right place for a biopsy. So through using this, and the, the software package that we use at UC Davis is called Bronchus, um, but through using this, we've really decreased the number of people that go on to have an open lung resection or a wedge biopsy or something else, an open procedure, which does carry morbidity. So we really reduce the number of these uh, pulmonary nodules that go on to surgical intervention. So this can be used for, uh, of course, other endemics as well. Does anybody know if your pulmonary docs use this at your center? Can you just raise your hand? So one other? They don't. They don't. So this is something that can be used. We, we really are big fans of this. It's reduced a lot of procedures for our patients. So I think something that you can take back to your center and use um, so to today. So that'll sort of stop uh, with coccidioides, but some of that, of course, you can apply to other endemics. But we'll move on to our next case, which is an infection we really don't talk about much at the MSG ever. Um, but this is a patient that we took care of, 65-year-old male painter who fell off a ladder painting the state capitol in California. Uh, he fell onto a bush and had a puncture on the dorsum of his hand, you can see here. Exam was with purulent drainage, no warmth, no lymphadenopathy, and his cultures came back about 10 days later. Um, so he had sporotrichosis. And, and so one of the taxonomic updates, which we'll mention just since this is a talk on diagnostics, is there's a number of species now. So um, uh, Brasiliensis, which has a very close life cycle relationship with the cat, Aschinkii, which um, conversely is with plants, Glovosa, Luria, and Mexicana. Prevalence is very low, 0.1 to 0.5%. And of course, as we all know, causes cutaneous disease. It spreads via the lymphatics. Um, pulmonary disseminates is pretty uncommon, but what I really wanted to talk about was sort of this change in the ecologic life cycle of uh, sp specifically Sporothrix brasiliensis. So you can see here we've traditionally thought of these as saprophytic organisms, but brasiliensis has really developed a unique niche within the feline host uh, really over the last two decades is what's been proposed from some of those different authors. And you can see here, which is a job I don't want at all to go around and culture cat claws, um, but they actually found sporothrix in 29% of cat claws in Brazil, uh, which has been responsible really for the majority of the outbreak um, at that location. So human cases with other shinkii, uh, typically on the extremities, again, because they're usually an injury. And then children often have it on their face or neck. A lot of those reports, interestingly, are because of the saprophytic uh, phase with sporothrix where it infects plants, and then the kids sort of put them and pick them up and carry them on their shoulder so they have direct inoculation onto their face and neck. 
um, as the site of inoculation. So a little bit different uh, type of exposure for those different infections. So to talk a little bit about Brasiliensis, again, that's the one that has a close life cycle relationship now with the feline host. And you can see this map of Brazil before the 1990s, from 90 to 2000, and then 2001 to 2016. They've really um, had the development of a large epidemic of sporothrix. They're really seeing a lot of cases over the last two decades. And, th and then the authors propose, and this is through a very low number of isolates. I'm a little bit skeptical, but quite interested in this. They are seeing a change in the MICs of sporothrix in those locations. So they have several isolates with amphotericin B MICs now more than one, itraconazole more than two, and their MICs are increasing with a shift in the MIC 90 from two to four um, during the middle of this outbreak as well. So that's a little unclear why that's occurring. Again, those patients are naive to therapy, uh, so what environmental pressure they're receiving uh, for MICs to increase is, is, is at this time remains unclear. So <clears throat> we've talked a lot about the taxonomic uh, changes that we have had to deal with, but this is one that we didn't have to deal with. This is one that the sporothrix community has been fighting about for a number of years with the folks that, that work on ophistioma. Um, and so this infection actually uh, is, is a plant pathogen. It does not cause uh, human infection at all. So it lives in the environment on logs, and these bark beetles climb in logs uh, to sort of eat the decaying matter. Uh, and then the canidia uh, are encrusted on their exoskeleton, and then the bark beetles climb up uh, particularly elm trees and bite uh, the branch points of branches that then infects the xylem of these elm trees, and they actually die from the infection, which sort of starts the life cycle back over. But the um, ophiostoma uh, organisms are phylogenetically very related to sporothrix, and this actually has precedence. Uh, so under a phylogenetic analysis, they actually found that the sporothrix uh, isolates that we're typically seeing all have a clinical clade, so they sort of agreed to just let us keep sporothrix rather than having to deal with further taxonomic changes. So I think this is a success story for us as clinical mycologists. We don't have to learn another organism. Um, so diagnostics for sporothrix, I, I think, again, really similar to these other endemics. Culture's definitive, about four, four to 20 days to, to grow. Histopathology can be very characteristic. These asteroid bodies can be seen, but they're not specific for sporothrix. They can be seen in a number of other infections. Um, serology is potentially useful. There's an immunodiffusion in western blot that's available. Latex agglutination, I think, is useful for sporothrix meningitis. There's been a number of uh, pa uh, papers written about that. And ELISA, using a cell wall antigen, the Brazil investigators have really been looking at in a number of papers over the last few years. And it appears to be useful as a response to therapy as well with the area under the curve of 0.9154, so a pretty good test in their hands, but that version is not available to us here in the, in the States. Uh, alternative methods, PCR is not uh, commercially available. Skin test, there is a sporotrichin. Um, skin test uh, possibility, but not available commercially either, been used only in the research setting. So treatment really hasn't changed much for quite some time. Infotericin B for severe disease. Um, I don't think I've ever given by potassium iodide, but itraconazole, uh, new azoles are sort of questionable. But one of the things is really these really long durations of therapy. So you can see here's a patient, this is our patient in question, took 467 days before his hand looked normal again. Um, so we'll talk about the toxicity with these agents in a few more slides. So on to the next case. This is a South American man, which gives away the diagnosis in this session. Um, but 65-year-old from Peru, three-month history of 20-pound weight loss, fatigue, and cough, appeared chronically ill, and had bilateral granulomatous disease. So this, of course, is paracoxidiomycosis. Um, Brasiliensis has been sort of what we've traditionally learned, but taxonomic changes in this organism have well have been proposed. So Lutei, Americana, Mistrepiensis, uh, and Venezuelensis as well. So characteristic histopathologic form. Uh, typically pulmonary infection, but can disseminate just like all of these organisms. Uh, and there is a double immunodiffusion gold standard that's available from LabCorp in the States if you do have a patient uh, coming back with potential paracoxidomycosis. There's also ELISA and conflict fixation testing. Uh, antigen detection is, is useful in the highly immunocompromised as well. And then so here's our last case um, from, from uh, these endemic mycoses, but this is a forester that was coming back from Thailand. 52-year-old uh, with really no prior history. He had a skin lesion on his face, and you can see with extensive lesions now. Um, and he had extensive worldwide travel in the course of his work as a forester. In states in his last trip, he, uh, last, last trip he tripped and fell, injured his forehead in a bamboo thicket. Um, so this is talomycosis, formerly penicilliosis. So it has this characteristic red pigment in culture. Uh, this can be a laboratory hazard, of course. It's associated with bamboo rats, so there is certainly a precedent in mycology for sort of these rodent hosts for these different infections. It's really seen only in Southeast Asia, of course. Uh, granulobinous infection, most of those patients have AIDS. There's a, um, Tui Lee has this really nice paper in the New England Journal just from last year. And culture is about 14 days to grow in the majority of those. Blood cultures are positive. 
uh, bone marrow about 100%, so more similar to histoplasma. Um, and then for non-invasive diagnostics, there is a cross-reactivity with galactomannan, and uh, antigen testing is up to 100% sensitive and specific in some settings. So that's sort of the clinical and diagnostic update. But what I wanted to talk about also was the treatment, because again, we do see a fair amount of toxicity with these agents when we use them for considerable amounts of time. So fluconazole, I think we've, we're all very comfortable using. It's generally benign. Uh, Dave Bulwer showed some slides yesterday about using doses up to 2,000 milligrams a day. But in our hands, when we treat our COXI patients with this, they really complain about this, um, the, particularly the alopecia, chelitis, and dry skin. So um, alopecia, they, they typically have a brush full of hair every day. Um, their lips can become chapped to the point they'll spontaneously bleed. Uh, so they really dislike fluconazole with long-term use. And we've actually done a study recently where we looked at over 300 patients on long-term fluconazole. Um, and once they exceed 30 days, 50% of the patients either self-discontinued the medication or their uh, treating physician changed them to an alternative azole. So if you change them to alternative azole, the alopecia resolves over about 90 days. The skin changes take about two weeks to go away. And we've actually looked at this in a rat model just to determine what type of hair loss this, this is. It's actually telogen effluvium. Um, you can see here, if you don't like rats and think they're ugly, you ought to see a rat that's losing its hair um, and also mad at you for giving it medication every day. Um, so the pathophysiology of this remains a little bit elusive, um, but such as the field of alopecia in general. Um, I care a little bit more about alopecia every year um, now that I'm in my mid-40s, so we'll continue to work on that. Um, a newer side effect that we have observed, particularly with posaconazole and itraconazole, was first noticed after sort of the transition from the liquid posa formulation to the tablets. And this is uh, Demetrius's paper where he sort of looked at a, a patient group that was switched from solution to tablet, had a very nice increase in their posaconazole blood levels from 0.74 to 1.92 as a median. But in this study, about 10% of the patients do have levels more than 3.5, which is a little bit different from that Monte Carlo simulation that was published several years ago with tablets when they thought that three would really be the maximum of a standard posaconazole dosing. Um, we've, we've pushed the posaconazole, posaconazole dosing in some of our COXI patients, as you can get MFCs in the three to four range for COXI. Um, but we have seen seven patients that had sort of this clinical triad of hypertension, hypokalemia, and alkalosis. Um, all of those patients, that seven patient group, had posa levels more than four. And on investigation of this, they have undetectable renin and aldosterone levels, elevated 11-deoxycortisol, and a change of the cortisol-cortisone ratio, where this is uh, cortisol is 10 times higher than cortisone. And if you look through this, what we think is happening is these uh, itraconazole and posaconazole inhibit these two enzymes within the steroid synthesis pathway, 11-beta-hydroxylase uh, and 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2. The two isoform is different than one, which goes back from cortisone to, uh, cortisone to cortisol. There's only about 18% homology between those two enzymes, so it looks like it's only this enzyme which converts cortisol to cortisone. Um, if you look back through literature, a number of case reports have looked at this phenomenon now, and the posaconazole levels uh, range is 3 to 9.5. Uh, the mean was 5.62, so it does look there might be a ceiling for toxicity for this agent. But again, due to sort of confusion and looking at our patients, they've had, uh, their labs are not always consistent. You can't always tell if it's this enzyme or this, and so we've looked at that now in the lab in a more specific fashion, trying to determine exactly which enzyme is inhibited and to what extent. And so this 11-beta-hydroxylase enzyme you can see here is preferentially inhibited by posaconazole in this curve, with itraconazole and uh, hydroxyitraconazole next. Uh, I say avuconazole a little bit, but at much, much higher doses, and then fluconazole and voriconazole very infrequently. And then the next step down, which is this uh, hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2, this red line um, shows about, that only about 15% of the activity remains in the presence of posa itra or hydroxy itra. But you can see that enzyme really is not inhibited by any of the other azoles we have. So we've seen a lot of these cases and gotten emails from physicians around the country that are also seeing this phenomenon. Uh, so it's pretty easy to treat. You just reduce the dose. You can give them aldactone if you want to, or you can transition to an alternative azole. So pretty easy for it to go away if you consider the diagnosis. Uh, and then last, just in one, voriconazole. We have a really difficult time in California having our patients tolerate voriconazole just to the amount of sunshine we have. Uh, but CNS and peripheral neuropathy from David Denning's work is really well known, hepatotoxicity. Uh, photopsia is, is in, in, if you don't know the mechanism for that, it really uh, turns on these bipolar on cells. That's sort of a cell behind the eye that's uh, allows the retina to communicate with the optic nerve, so it turns that pathway on, which is why they have this photopsia. Photosensitivity is this inoxide metabolite, so that's when this fluorine comes off and this, this region is oxidized. Uh, so that there's, there's a several papers in the dermatologic literature where they've actually just done this on the skin of patients, and that actually causes photosensitivity. And then long-term use, again, we, we treat uh, with, with the endemic mycoses. A lot of these patients are going to end up on lifelong therapy. Uh, cutaneous malignancy is, of course, a concern. 
And then we've seen fluoride toxicity, and this is one of our patients who had who came in, who was actually referred to us because they wanted to see if we needed to change his antifungal regimen because they thought he had multiple myeloma. Uh, and we actually said, no, he has fluorosis. His fluoride level was about 19, uh, and normal is about 2. Um, so he had all these what we call exostoses. This is extra bone growth at all these locations throughout his body from the fluoride uh, that comes off of this location uh, with chronic voriconazole therapy. So that's sort of a conclusion of the update of these endemic mycoses. Um, so we talked a little bit about the evolutionary biology, the changing epidemiology, and endemicity. There's been multiple taxonomic changes. I think we've been saved from Sporothrix changing its name, which is nice. Um, new diagnostics are under active evaluation by a number of different companies. Uh, and then don't forget about toxicity. These agents do have cumulative toxicity for these patients the longer they're on therapy. There continue to be a number of unanswered questions, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the session later today. But the genomics, why do some of these patients disseminate and others do not? Uh, new diagnostics, performance characteristics. Really, what's the best agent? We don't have comparative studies for most of these different organisms. Uh, combination therapy has been looked at only retrospectively. We haven't published that data. Um, I, but I think others are also looking at that with other endemic mycoses. Uh, drug repurposing, uh, we heard about yesterday a little bit. We've looked at that with sertraline and tamoxifen with COXI. Both work in the lab, don't work in animals. Uh, and then new toxicities, and I think we've talked a little bit about that too. Um, but thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure. With regard to your patients that uh, you say if you treat them within two weeks, they don't develop a complement-fixing antibody, does that imply that they are at risk to get reinfected? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so, so there's, there's precedence in the literature. I mean, that's why we, you know, prevent rheumatic um, fever, right, with strep throat. That's why we prevent development of the M anti um, antibody. Um, syphilis, the same thing. If they have a very early lesion and you give them penicillin, they sometimes never manifest an RPR. Um, so if these patients are immune, I don't know. I mean, it's primarily T cell immunity, we think. Um, and there's, there's one mouse paper they've looked at B cell immunity, and it played sort of a minor role. Um, so I don't think that's known. Uh, we've followed those patients now for almost 10 years, and none of them have developed COXI, but it's a pretty small number. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's sort of interesting that we can't use their titers to follow them. The people that uh, you say get reinfected after they had disseminated the disease, you showed the nice graft, et cetera, uh, graph, rather. those folks, have they ever disseminated again once you, because they've already disseminated once, theoretically, according to that graph. Mm -hmm. um, do they, have you seen anybody have their titer go back up to 1 to 16, 1 to 32, or disseminate? No, um, that's a good question. But that group that we saw, the titers spike years and years later, they were very small, 1 to 4, 1 to 8 titers. We do conversely, though, see, uh, and we have a big cohort of coxie meningitis patients we sort of accumulated over the years. And we have some of those patients that have very high drug levels, VORI levels of uh, four, four and a half, posaconazole levels of three, and they will come in with acute recurrence of their coxie meningitis, um, despite documented compliance by TDM monitoring. And we think those are ruptured granulomas with, along their spinal canal uh, as a cause of their recurrence of infection. On that same topic, you mentioned the possibility they could be reinfected, and I wonder, is there any chance of getting cultures of the, keeping a culture of the initial infection and seeing if you could get another one? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we'd love to get sequential isolates from these. Uh, so looking at a big database um, with several hundred patients that have isolates, there's six patients that have sequential isolates, so we'll, we'll, we'll do whole genome analysis on those, because that would prove it, of course, right? If it's a relapse or is it reinfection? Um, but the majority of those patients, they have such few symptoms, they don't go undergo bronchoscopy or any, you know, culture evaluation. Uh, but it would be nice to have them, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much.